I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about water. Lots of water. Salt water in particular. I'd like to talk about the world's oceans. But first, I want to try, try a little bit of a test here. How many of you would say, when you think reach inside yourself, I shouldn't slap the microphone, <laughs> reach inside yourself, um, would say you have a direct connection of some sort to our local or the world's oceans. How many of you feel some kind of a direct connection? Quite a few. OK, how many would say, well, I'm not quite so sure. I don't know if I'd say I have a direct connection, but yeah, I kind of like them. Raise your hands. Great. I'd like to spend the next few minutes exploring some of the connections, some you may know about, and we'll get to it, and some you may not. So we live in a, a seaside city, in a seaside province, in a country with the longest coastline in the world. Canada's coastline is about 240,000 kilometers. Maybe you live by English Bay, or you walk or run on the seawall. Maybe you sail or, or know some friends who have a boat. Living here, it's possible you take a ferry occasionally across the water to Victoria or someplace on Vancouver Island. Or maybe you know somebody who fishes for a living. Ah, seafood, a Vancouver staple. Who among us doesn't like good seafood? And fillings? Some of you have fillings? So both modern medicine and modern dentistry use a variety of products that come from the oceans, including the dental cement that glues in all your fillings. We're all connected to the oceans in some surprising ways that we'll explore in the next few minutes, hence the toilet, and we'll come back to that. So most of us, I think most of you would agree with me that our coastlines are beautiful. Our oceans are inspiring. They've inspired artists, they've inspired musicians for, for eons. And they even inspire many of us, even when stormy. Um, this picture came from a friend in, in Newfoundland and, uh, whose lighthouse is about to be run over. So the oceans go all the way from absolutely calm, peaceful, and pastoral to fits of rage. They're full of interesting life some of which we're used to looking at, some we find curious. This is an Arctic cod taken under the ice in Nunavut. And some we don't quite understand. This is a glass sponge. This is a silicon-based animal from Howe Sound, truly a different life form. So the, the, ocean, the, the oceans make up 73% of the Earth's surface. And someone far smarter than I said, well, gee, we shouldn't have called this planet Earth. We should have called it water or ocean, because we truly are an ocean planet. All of the astronauts who go to space comment on the fact that it is a blue planet. But the oceans are so vast that for eons, we humans have, have thought of them as absolutely limitless. They're deep. The ocean's average depth is 14,000 feet, or 4.3 kilometers. At its deepest, the oceans are deeper than Mount Everest is tall. The volume of water is mind-boggling. It's about 36 sextillion gallons. Put another way, if you flooded Canada with, if you stacked all the world's ocean water on top of Canada, it would be 140 kilometers deep. So it's, of all water on Earth, and we're just hearing about fresh water, 97% of all water on Earth is salt water. Only 3% is fresh water. And of that 3%, half of that is frozen into ice caps and glaciers, principally in Antarctica, in Greenland, and then, and then Canada's in number three position. Of that remaining 1.5% of fresh water that's free flowing, Canada has about 19% of it. But most of it flows north to the Arctic Ocean and is relatively unavailable to us simply because of how large the country is and the lack of infrastructure. Some of you may have seen um, Canadian Jim Cameron's voyage to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. We humans have been to the bottom of the world's oceans twice, which is far less than people have been to the moon. His dive last year was just the second to the bottom of the Challenger Deep, which is in the Marianas Trench, which is a canyon, a submarine canyon south of Guam in the Pacific. We have far better maps of the moon than we have of the ocean bottom. And we humans have seen less than one-tenth of one percent of the seabed, 
worldwide. The oceans interact with and influence our atmosphere, our weather, and our climate. So as the, as the atmosphere warms and the ocean warms, it changes the pattern of evaporation, which supplies the moisture that falls as rain or snow on land, in things that uh, something the scientists call the water cycle. So we, our human changes to, to the atmosphere particularly, which then b boomerang to changes to the ocean, are causing it, the climate, and therefore the weather, to be more unpredictable. So over the next uh, dozens of years, we're going to see more and more unpredictable weather, with more rain some places and less rain others. We're going to see more significant weather anomalies, which is what weather scientists call storms like Superstorm Sandy and the rains that, that hit Calgary. We're also seeing places in the world with, with rapidly developing lacks of rainfall. Well, this is going to affect food production in some parts of the world, including a big band right across the middle of the US. Not so much in Canada, um, but it's going to make for food security issues and price increases in, in coming decades. One in six jobs on Earth is related to the oceans. Fifty years ago, half those jobs were related to harvesting the ocean's bounty, to uh, fishing. But thanks to decades of overfishing and overexploitation, and thanks to technology, we're down to one in, in 300 jobs uh, now being related to, to fishing. So fishing is important. Around the world, we consume about 130 million tons of seafood a year. That's about four tons of seafood for each Canadian. One billion people, though, around the world depend on that seafood for their protein. In other words, they exist, or their existence is, is fundamentally based on marine protein. For us here, often seafood is a luxury or a semi-luxury item. We'll come back to, to seafood in a minute, because it's a, overfishing is the single biggest problem facing the world's oceans at the moment. So I talked just a second ago about the interaction between the ocean and our climate and our weather. But it does something more important. So I want to try something. For the next couple of minutes, I want each of you to, to sit as you sit and listen. Take, skip every other breath. Just breathe half as often as you normally do. It's difficult, even without the exercise uh, that, uh, that she, she's doing. It's almost impossible. And yet, that's what we'll be faced with if we manage to do something to the, all of the floating plankton cells in the world's oceans that deliver us 60 to 70% of our oxygen. So whoever called the rainforest the lungs of the planet didn't know that most of the oxygen we breathe, or a, a greater percentage, over half, comes from those little single-celled plants that float around in the ocean. This is a photomicrograph of one. They exist in all parts of the world's oceans, but exist in, in such dense concentrations that the blooms can be seen from space. So they live in the top 100, 150 meters of water. And that's the part of the ocean that's being most affected by the changes we're, we're causing in our atmosphere. So as we dump more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, more of it absorbs into the ocean. And on one hand, you could say, well, gee, that should be good for all those little plankton. They are plants, after all. They use carbon dioxide and sunlight, and through photosynthesis, they make oxygen. That, that's terrific. More oxygen. Who's against that? But it's some of the other changes that that carbon dioxide absorbing into the ocean uh, are causing that's, that is of concern. So in the Arctic Ocean, the pH or the acidity of the ocean has dropped by 0 0.04. Now, on the on the, one, the 0 to 14 scale that scientists use to measure how acid or how basic something is, with seven, 7 being neutral, you think, well, gee, 0 0.4 is not very much. But it is enough to in, impact the other part of the plankton world, and that's the animal plankton or zooplankton. So zooplankton swim around in the ocean. They eat the plant plankton, the phytoplankton. And they, in turn, are the base of the food chain for fish, the things that eat fish, and so on up, up to us. So that 
you'll hear scientists talk more and more in coming years about ocean acidification. And that's what they're talking about, is as CO2 absorbs into the ocean, it causes a pH shift down towards acid, because the oceans are normally slightly basic. So some of these changes that are coming uh, toward us down the pipeline will affect us right here at home. They'll affect our family, our economy, our, our culture. As the ocean, as the atmosphere warms, one of the things that's happening is we're seeing accelerated melt in glaciers. Not so much in Antarctica yet, definitely in Canada and, and Greenland, and that's causing the sea level to rise. So sea level rise is not much right now, three millimeters a year on average. And you think, well, shoot, it'll take forever to, to even cause the sea level to rise a meter. Um, but it's expected to accelerate to half a centimeter within the next 25 years. So if you live in Bangladesh or you live in the Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean, you already know there's a problem. We're used to seeing our ocean go up and down. So this picture from the Stanley Park seawall at low tide, um, plenty of freeboard. But it, doesn't take, it won't take much ocean level rise uh, for it to flood the seawall. Even more importantly, when you add a storm surge on top of it, it can wreak havoc, as it did with Superstorm Sandy. So one of the questions that we're asking is, well, how far ahead should government be thinking about and planning raising the dikes in Richmond, for example? Let's talk, come back to seafood for a moment, because it's something that's an integral part of our culture and our life here. By the mid-1950s, we'd killed most of the great whales in the world. Now we know that 90% of the large ocean predators are gone. So those would be the swordfish, the sharks, and the tunas. Earlier this year, a record price was paid for one single fish at a, at a commercial wholesale fish market in Tokyo. $1.8 million for a single bluefin tuna. In eastern Canada, 70% of the stocks, fishery stocks that have been assessed, have been found to have collapsed meaning they're, they're now at ten, less than 10% of their former biomass. Aquaculture around the world is the fastest growing food system, bar none. So this year, or next year, aquaculture will be about dead even with wild caught. So here we think salmon when we think aquaculture. But around the world, it's approaching 100 species that are cultured. And, and that aquaculture is absolutely imperative to some of those billion people who depend on marine protein for their very livelihood. Let's come back to the toilet, which does directly connect us to the oceans because everything we flush down one of those things goes right into rivers, lakes, streams, and the ocean. So sewage treatment plants uh, screen out most of the bulky stuff. Sophisticated ones like you see on the screen uh, d d digest some of the organic matter, but none of them takes out the chemicals from the industrial plants, nor the chemicals or pharmaceuticals that go through us. So if you take birth control pills, or if you have children, you are a part of a problem that scientists are becoming more concerned about and trying to understand in the ocean. So when I wash my grandchildren's clothes, I'm contributing, because today, all children's clothing and many cloth products, probably even the seats you're sitting on, are treated with fire retardant chemicals. Those chemicals go right through us, in the case of birth controls, or right through the sewage treatment plants into the ocean. Scientists call them, call them hormone disruptors because they're so close in action to natural hormones like estrogen that they're causing a lot of problems. We're finding if they don't cause a, a disease or a tumor like you see in this fish, they're causing early maturation of fish. They're causing fish that are both male and female at the same time. Talk about a confused fish. <laughs> and, they're talking, and they're causing uh, depression of immune systems in a lot of animals, including our killer whales in BC, which are veritable uh, uh, toxic waste dumps. Oh, and that plastic bottle that fell out of the receptacle where you properly threw it, it's congregating, more and more of them are congregating in the world's oceans in, in gyres, which is a current that kind of pinwheels around a central point. So the plastic breaks down, but it never completely goes away. It breaks down into micro pieces. 
So scientists now know that there is plastic everywhere in the world's oceans, including the bottom of the Arctic Ocean, where there isn't exactly a large population disposing of plastic bottles and, and other plastics. The problem isn't the, problem isn't the plastic itself, uh, because, you know, well, okay, the, some of the fish are eating the plastic. It's what adheres to the plastic. It's that the heavy metals and some of the pesticides stick to plastic at a rate uh, up to 1,000 times the concentration in open, open ocean water. So the fish, are, when they eat a piece of plastic, are already eating a bioaccumulated dose. OK, so there are problems. That's eh, a long way from us. Do we care? Um, I care um, because of the intrinsic value. I like eating seafood. I like breathing oxygen. There's a whole new body of economics springing up. <laughs> Whole new body of economics springing up where, where economists are trying to calibrate or calculate what, what they call ecosystem services. These are the free things that nature gives us. And they are important in our economy, but they're relatively unquantified and in some cases unquantifiable. What can I do? I hear that question all the time. The first thing is easy. Just pay a little more attention. This is not boring stuff. These stories are quite fascinating and interesting. So you can, you can uh, signal by paying attention. Uh, first, you'll, you'll understand some of the connections each of you have better, and we can understand some of the things we can do. We're lucky in BC. We can choose sustainable seafood when we want to. Just pick an ocean-wise restaurant or market. So cut down your use of plastics where you can. Reuse, recycle. And if you have to pitch it, do it responsibly where it won't get loose in nature. You want to do more? Sign up for the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup or, any, or some of the other programs that operate in the marine environment. No helium balloons, particularly the mylar ones. They pop, fall in the ocean, get eaten by particularly turtles, and are one reason that all sea turtles in all parts of the world's oceans are endangered. Nothing down a storm drain. No oil, no lawn chemicals. Every storm drain in BC goes right into the ocean. Don't exploit. Don't buy turtle products when you're on vacation or shark products. And pick wisely when you go on vacation. And we can all reduce our energy a bit. So each of us is only one person. But taken together, we're quite a force. An old professor used to say, the beach of success is made up of billions of grains of sand. Each one of us is part of that billion grains of sand, and we can make a difference. Thank you.